Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and the author of The Rejuvenate Blueprint. And Lovely listeners, I hope you all had a wonderful weekend, and we're so happy that you are joining us with joining us today on this fine Tuesday, and that uh, the rest of your week in front of you looks good. And again, always thanks for those comments. Keep them coming. We really love love listening to them, love reading them, and love responding. So today's episode, we are talking about, and it took me a little bit for a little swallow because where my imagination goes, parasites. You know those creepy little crawly thingies that none of us. Um, well, at least me, I know, don't really like to think about. But um, yeah, because I've uh, seen a couple of frightening programs on television that you know you can't unsee. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes those, how can I say, life forms do reside within us. And so today we're diving deep into it. Um, Elwin brought up the um, the work of Dr. Hulda Clark. Not sure if many of you are familiar with her, but if you're not, please do check her out. And today we're looking at her works and her claim was that, and please correct me if I get this wrong, um, her claim was that many health concerns were a direct result of parasitic infections. So I'm going to pass this right over to you, Elwin. What do you think about that claim? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I am looking forward to talking about this. It was a school of thought which impacted me, you know, a while ago. And I have to say, we didn't do this episode earlier, even though it's quite a foundational thing, simply because it's been a few years since I, uh, you know, read all the books and, you know, was involved in that world. But I thought it's still worth talking about for a couple of reasons. Because you know, I try and follow as broad a range of different health experts as I can on social media. And what I find is um, periodically someone or, you know, their followers, commenters, or whatever, will stumble upon this world, this corner of the alternative health world that basically says that uh, parasites are the root cause of all kinds of diseases. And it's a very interesting thing that I want to talk about because I think it's a world that's full of misinformation and I kind of actually think that everyone gets this wrong and so um, that's why I thought it's worth talking about based on my experience what which I want to share so when I say me, everyone wait, I was gonna say if you could also clarify that everyone gets this wrong do you if you could is it mean just about parasites does it mean about finding one thing the issue of parasites, yeah. So the mainstream perspective on parasites, let's explain that first. So if you go to a doctor and say, I think my health problem has caused my parasite, um, what they will probably say to you is, you know, do you have certain symptoms? But they will also, and this might actually be the first question they ask you, they will say, you know, have you been to a, a tropical country recently, in the last year or something like that usually? And if you say no, they will say, well, it's not parasites then. And as far as they're concerned, case closed, end of story. And so, you know, pretty much in most cases with most doctors anyway. And so basically what I'm saying is, uh, from a mainstream point of view, people in tropical countries or I guess third world countries, I'm not sure what you're supposed to call that now, people without good sanitation, uh, they get parasites, children get parasites, pets get parasites, animals get parasites, but for some reason, from a mainstream point of view, adult, white, <laughs> I guess, or, you know, first world, whatever you want to call it, humans are the only ones that never get parasites. And so, <laughs> as I said, there is a certain, so I think that is wrong be, uh, for reasons that will probably become clear throughout this episode. But then there is another school of thought as I said, this corner of the internet that you'll probably stumble into sooner or later if you're interested in natural health, alternative health, whatever you want to call it, that basically is pretty convinced and pretty convincing that all health problems, or at least a lot of them, are in fact caused by parasites and that there's either like a conspiracy to make you not aware of that, and we can maybe talk about the conspiracy angle, or that it's simply a function of uh, testing that they're not able to test for it very well. So if you are convinced that you have parasites, for instance, if they're causing your health problems, and then you go into uh, a doctor's office and they, uh, I don't know, they're humoring you or whatever, they're like, all right, we'll test for it. So then what they will do is a stool test, usually. 
And if they do not find uh, fragments of parasites in your stall, then they will say that you don't have parasites. And um, as the kind of people who believe in you know, the importance of parasites will say, this is not as definitive as they make it sound. Um, f first of all, uh, there could be, like, there are reasons why in this particular store sample you may not have pieces of parasite. There are all kinds of reasons why that could not be the case. But this is get you know gets a little bit technical. But the more obvious, simple to understand thing is parasites are places other than your intestines. They can be in oh, your mouth. I was gonna say, you know, you can hear awful things about just underneath the skin, in the eye, in the brain, yep. in the heart. Absolutely. Yep, all those places, the muscle. So basically anywhere in the body other than the bones <laughs> could potentially be infested uh, with a parasite. And, and you know, none of those areas are checked, again, except for in very specific circumstances that we can go into. So this is kind of like a dual episode. It's about parasites, but it is also about the work of Helder Clark because when I kind of trace back the lineage of most of the modern day people who are in the alternative health world focused, who think parasites are, you know, like a key part of the health puzzle, they're usually quite heavily influenced by the work of Helda Clark. So I do want to talk about her. Um, however, it, she's not the only one. Like I just sent you a link, Chrissy, to a, uh, a scientist who had published a peer reviewed study um, who is using antiparasitic drugs in his case, although it's also been done with antiparasitic herbs, um, to cure people of, um, or claiming to cure people of, malignant neoplasmas, the things we're not allowed to talk about, the C word on YouTube. Um, and so we'll put a link there so you can find out more about that. And so this is part of it as well. Um, and again, this person isn't the first. There is a whole school about this now. And I saw someone talking about this on the Joe Rogan experience. So that's big, right? But tens of millions of people have probably seen that. Um, although I only saw a clip, I didn't see the whole episode. There's someone talking about basically the Fenbendazole pro protocol. And Fenbendazole is in the antiparasitic class of drugs. And this, uh, and so there was a doctor who saw that um, people were, or was it animals? Maybe animals were getting better from even very severe advanced um, C word as a result of using fenbendazole. And so he had stage four in the lungs, I think. And he decided to just take it as a Hail Mary, why not? you know, what you're going to do, like this pet parasite thing. And it went away. That's the story anyway. And he had a protocol, but basically it was just for Mendazole. I think turmeric and CBD were the other things, but, you know, he put mostly power on the Fenbendazole. So I also want to talk about it from that angle because the people who believe that parasites are like the root cause of a lot of diseases may be influenced directly or indirectly by Hulder Clark, um, they often use antiparasitics, unsurprisingly, right? Either antiparasitic herbs or antiparasitic drugs. And sometimes they have miraculous healing results. And so, of course, that reinforces their belief that it was a parasite that caused the disease, because when I take an antiparasitic, it goes away. But it turns out that antiparasitics have all kinds of interesting uh, mechanisms that actually have an effect on things other than parasites. Definitely viruses, and so that's where there was the big thing. I think we're allowed to talk about this now with COVID, right, and ivermectin, where, you know, at the time, a lot of people were saying it was a cure or that it was a prophylactic, so it was preventative, or that, you know, it was a useful treatment at least, like it can help to some degree in some cases. And... So that's another whole thing. And so, but then the people who really believe in parasites are like, well, that's because really it was a parasite that was the problem. It wasn't a virus at all. Some of the same people who believe that parasite is the root cause of everything don't even believe that viruses exist or, you know, it's like a whole thing. Uh, it gets really complicated. And then, of course, there is this thing that these malignant cells... Neoplasms, yes. Yes, also have 
uh, specific properties, um, which I'll explain more in that research paper that I sent you, Chrissy. Uh, well, there's a link to a it contains a link to a research paper. Yeah, I found the, um, I, I found went and found it, so I've got the link to the actual research paper now too. So I will make sure I put that down in the description for any of those that want to find out further. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so basically, there's something about those kind of cells that they can be disrupted and successfully treated, and we can even throw the word cure around maybe um, with antiparasitic drugs, potentially antiparasitic herbs as well. So all of that sounds great. And so at this point, if you believe everything I say, which hopefully you don't, but if you do, you might be on the, oh, let me try it. But here's the thing, here's the problem. Those antiparasitics, um, both drugs and herbs, are not 100% harmless. I was going to say, what are the potential side effects? Let's say there is a parasite, isn't a parasite. Yeah, what are the potential dangers? Well, this is, again, something that is, you know, very much contested. Obviously, if we take ivermectin as an example, as I hope we can talk about this now, let's see. Um, you know, when it, people were first using it, I think it was early 2021, there was all this warning of queues outside hospitals of people who uh, couldn't get in because the hospital was overwhelmed with people who had accidentally overdosed on ivermectin. I think that turned out to be a lie. Um, but it's still true that it is possible to overdose on this stuff, even though it is safe. Um, it's definitely true that it's possible to overdose on the herbs commonly used. Wormwood, black walnut, um, cloves, garlic, uh, uh, papaya seeds even, all these kind of commonly used things. Um, now, are they as dangerous as a lot of the drugs that are used? Uh, regularly even, to treat serious diseases? No. And so that is the defense of these things. That right. So is it as um, harmful or potentially life-threatening as, let's say, chemo or other certain pharmaceutical drugs that are prescribed for other treatments? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say no. The evidence does seem to say no. However, that doesn't mean that it is totally harmless. So anything that you take that kills things, and so... You know, antibiotics are another example of this that are pretty you know, commonly understood. Anything that kills things uh, is a poison in some way. Now, what you hope is that the poisoning effect on the organism you're trying to target is really, really significant. And then the poisoning effect on your human cells is really, really minor in comparison. Um, <laughs> and so that is part of the problem of chemotherapy, right? I'm no expert on this, but obviously the gap between it killing the cells you want it to kill versus it killing the healthy cells is not a huge gap. And so that is a, you know, a concern. But, um, and so that's, you know, the, that research paper I sent you, uh, that's one of the touted benefits of using that approach of these antiparasitic drugs instead is that that gap is bigger. But like, it's not as if it's 100% safe. And so that's the other reason I wanted to talk about it because I was one of those people who just kind of did a uh, extensive parasite killing protocol at some point. And and when you say extensive, what is that? Once a month, once a couple of times a year? Uh, well, when I, you know, I mm, like every day for maybe a month or something. Um, I mean, the Holder Clark protocol, if I remember this off the top of my head correctly, is like you start quite low and then you build up until it's quite high over the course of two weeks. And then uh, you do it again once every, you do a high dose, but you do it once every week or once every two weeks. So that's the kind of standard protocol with her. But that's the standard one. Um, she has like, you know, more intensive ones for people who have more serious problems, for instance. And so I think, I'm pretty sure I did a more intensive one at, at some points. Um, and then also I was having a, period of time where it was alleviating my symptoms. So that would be another reason I probably did it way longer than you should. Um, so, so yeah, I just want to talk about the potential, you know, benefits and drawbacks, but maybe we should kind of zoom out and start with talking about the theory itself and um, 
maybe a little bit about Hulda Clark's work. What yeah, I'd love I'd love to get into that because then I also have some questions as well. Like you know, to be honest, really, we'll go to uh, let, let's let's dive into her work and then I'll break it down into my questions. You know, like how common are these? You know, one out of ten people do ten people have it? Is it just two people? So yeah, let's let's start with um, Dr. Clark and um, yeah, if you could enlighten us and share your knowledge of her work with us, that'd be great. Okay, so this will be uh, you know, very concise, or oh, that's my goal. Um, so she was someone who um, I believe came from a naturopathic background, and she worked with a lot of people, and she helped a lot of people. I met some people personally who worked with her who really f feel that you know she helped them. I met a couple of people who trained under her. Um, and so she did a series of books, probably the most well-known is uh, The Cure for All Diseases. Now that is a bold title yeah. <laughs> as things go, which is highly compelling. Um, and so in The Cure of All Diseases, I just flicked through it for five minutes before this, while I was waiting. Um, you know, she says right in the first couple of pages that basically the Bottom line is that all diseases are caused by either one of two things, either by an infection or by a toxin. So if we bring it back to the Rejuvenate Blueprint, which of course talks about the seven root causes of um, chronic disease, she focuses on three and six within that system. Um, and you know she's convinced that those are the most important, or in fact that that's you know, really the root. Now, of course... <sighs> It all depends on your definition of the word root. Um, but I would say a lot of the time when I deal with people who are difficult to help. Difficult meaning their uh, their issues are quite a lot and they're really not very well. Just not easy, right? Yeah. With, with some people, you yeah. just give them some basic advice and they do it and they feel better. And then some people, that's not the case. Right, so, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, difficult for whatever reason. Um it could be because they've had the problem so long, could be because the problem is so severe, could be because the problem is so complex, because could be because the problem is so obscure. You know, it could be a few different things. But yeah, the people who are difficult to help, um, often it is because the root of it is uh, a toxin or an infection. And those things are just more difficult to deal with. They're often more difficult to identify. And so, yeah, maybe that answers the question. Um, so, so I can see where she would come to that uh conclusion conclusion because you know the people who are easy to help they already had someone point out more obvious stuff and so i guess maybe she had a lot of people come to her who'd already tried a lot of stuff and so that was you know what she came to and she has loads and loads and loads of anecdotes which i'm sure are genuine loads of stories of people coming to her for all kinds of complicated you know generally chronic although sometimes also acute conditions where she managed to help that person to reverse them. And so what was her treatments? Now, again, I'm going to simplify this as a nutshell. So if you are a Holder Clark, uh, you know, fan or practitioner or whatever, I'm sorry if you feel like I'm oversimplifying it, but this is going from memory and just trying to keep it short. In a nutshell, her approach was, um, she did also believe in nutrition. So we talked about the rejuvenate blueprint. Um, she had, you know, opinions on certain things that you that you should, like, that are not too common. Uh, like, she believed in magnesium supplementation, for instance, but she was also a big fan of calcium, which most alternative health practitioners aren't. She would recommend that people have, uh, you know, milk, for instance, uh, uh, for healing. Um, but, you know, there wasn't a massive focus on uh, nutrition. So the focus was really on toxins. So she was very aware of heavy metals. And the other class of toxins that she was also very focused on was different types of alcohols. So talking about... Um, heavy metals is very common, but talking about different types of alcohols, and when I talk about alcohols, I'm not really talking about uh, beer and wine and stuff. I'm talking about like the alcohols that are used as cleaning products, the alcohols that are used in, um, you now she talks about the cleaning products used in industrial machinery, for instance, like she wasn't a fan of most supplements or uh, any kind of processed anything, you know, protein powder, whatever, because she, her opinion was all these things in the, the act of processing are processed within machinery that is cleaned with all these industrial solvents, which are extremely toxic. And so, 
yeah, that's a big thing she focused on. And, you know, not crazy. I mean, still, you know, if you look at Nutrival, which uh, you and I often look at, Chrissy, you'll see it's one of the toxins that they're registering and they're, they're seeing if there's a buildup of it as a overall marker of, um, you know, if your body's overburdened with toxins. So, uh, you know, certainly some validity to that. So those are the, but again, she was operating at a time where, for instance, mycotoxins were not really talked about yet. So, you know, that might be another reason for it. Those are the ones that she was aware of. Um, and so in order to help with toxins, she was focused on reducing exposure. That's the number one thing. But the other thing also was um, helping the elimination organs. And she especially focused on the liver and the kidneys. And so the usual holder clark protocol was you do a kidney flush first, which would involve doing kidney herbs. Um, it's like usually parsley boiled in water, drink the water, and then like a tea made out of a bunch of other kidney herbs or sometimes capsules containing the kidney herbs. Then it's the usual suspects, things like uva ursi and uh, goldenrod and dandelion and all of that kind of stuff, nettle. And so she would uh, get people to flush the kidneys, I think for a week or two of that tea, uh, then get them to do liver flushing. Liver flushing, I think, is something we've talked about before. That's this idea that, which, you know, is accurate, is that stones, either in the form of calcium stones or more commonly, like, hardened lumps of bile, perhaps containing some kind of toxicity within the middle of the lump, uh, build up in the liver and the gallbladder and reduce its functioning. And so we talked, we have a whole episode on that on cholestasis, so we can refer people to that to find out more. But anyway, there's a quite harsh method of kind of forcing uh, a clearance of the liver and gallbladder called a liver flush. And so that was one of the things that she often prescribed to people. And then the idea is once you've done those two things, uh, like enough, only then would you go on to parasite cleansing. And I say that because I think often that is missed in the modern kind of interpretations of work or in other people teaching stuff. They go straight to doing uh, parasite cleanses of one type or another. And so one of the problems, of course, of antiparasitics, certainly with herbals, which is what she recommended, but also drugs, as I said, is they are still poisonous to some degree. And so, so you need those detox pathways open. You need those systems operating, at least operating some, because if they're not at all, then everything is just going to get backed up. Yeah, that was her uh, philosophy, which, you know, obviously we definitely agree with here at the Juvenile, path, uh, uh, Juvenile Podcast. We want to clear out the exit pathways before we start giving your body more toxins to deal with. In most cases, unless someone is already very clear and very healthy. Yes, exactly. So uh, so that's you know, a good thing, I would say. And I'm not sh she didn't invent the rejuvenate, uh, sorry, the, the liver flush. But as far as I'm aware, she's the first person to popularize it. There was like Andreas Moritz who came afterwards, for instance, who made it his thing and you know wrote the book about specifically liver flushing and, and all the rest of it. And there's loads of other people who've taught it since. Uh, but I believe... It was like an, uh, uh, like a traditional technique, but she was the first one who put it in a book, I believe, um, or at least in a popular book. And so she popularized that concept as well. And, uh, and so that's still a thing, like those, often when you buy like a kidney flushing formula from even Amazon or whatever, like the herbs that'll be in that is often like a Holder Clark recipe. So you kind of want to give her credit for some of this stuff. Um, and then, yeah, then it would be parasite cleansing. And so I don't even know if those antiparasitic drugs, they well, they would have existed, but they weren't as popular, certainly back then, and she never recommended them. So, you know, her thing was always using um, um, wormwood, black walnut hull, and cloves was the key thing. So wormwood and black walnut hull both work on killing different types of parasites, and also all kinds of other stuff, as we'll get into, we talked about earlier. Um, and then the idea of the cloves, C-L-O-V-E-S, um, is that they would kill the eggs. So that was the idea. And so you would take these parasite-killing stuff for a while. Maybe it's actually three weeks, not two weeks, her protocol. After It's not more than that. It's between two and three weeks. Um, you would take it for long enough is the idea that the parasites die, then the eggs 
get, and then you have to take it long enough to also kill the eggs. Otherwise, the parasites just grow back again. That was the theory. Um, and then also, she was really big on talking about hygiene. So she was not a fan of pets. Uh, I said earlier that she liked milk, so she was not a fan of raw milk. In fact, she told people that you should boil your milk, even from the shop, because it still wasn't safe. You know, She believed that a lot of disease was caused just by people not washing their hands and touching a pet or touching something they shouldn't and then putting their hands in their mouth. So she was a really big fan of you know, hygiene much more than most natural alternative health people are. Not that we're all, you know, dirty scuzz bags, but more, I guess that we're more usually on the side of thinking, ah, eh, you know, you want a strong immune system, you don't have to be too scared of dirt, whatever. She was not of that thinking. She was of the thinking of, you want to avoid uh, things that are infectious. Now she's, and she focused a lot on parasites, but she also focused on bacteria. She also focused on fungal infections. She also focused on uh, viruses. So her idea, though, was that often parasites are at the root of it, along with toxins. So it's like, so her theory was, so the toxins create the weakness that then allows the parasites to grow. And then the parasites contain uh, bacteria. And then the bacteria contain viruses. I think I've got that. I think I've got all those elements correct from her beliefs. And so her idea is then if you, if you, if you take an antibacterial, it might work temporarily, but it will come back because the parasites are where the bacteria is coming from. So that's why you have to kill the parasites. Um, and so that's kind of a generalization. Obviously, sometimes people get bacterial infections on their own or viral infections on their own. But, you know, she believed that often there was this order, especially it's where someone has persistent problems, where it's hard to help them. It's because they have these parasites in there that then also harbor all these other infectious um, organisms. And so she's really big on hygiene. Oh, yeah. So the other thing for parasites that she was really big on, and this is where we get now into stuff that is really not probably mainstream science supported. Everything I've said so far is ish. It's just a question of um, how common it is, which the question you asked me that was more debatable. Um, but what, she really believed in energy medicine. And so she, she even gave instructions to like how to build your own um, in the book. And so she gave instructions to how to build your own, I don't remember the name for it, but like a, a meter to test frequency to see what you oh, have. Yeah. Um, oh, when I was looking her up just in the, on the store or something, um, micro zap or some kind of zapper or. So that's the zapper. S but synchro zap. And maybe, yeah, that might be something different than what you're talking about. Yeah. They're all something different. Um, but. So she, she believed in like measuring. So a lot of her stories were like, person had a problem, nothing helped them. I used my device to test them. It said they had X organism and X toxin, right? And then I treated them for it. And so the way that she treated people for it, first of all, everything I've just said, but then the other thing would be, as you just said there, Chrissy, zappers. So the other type of device um, that I don't, she didn't create it, but if she, popularized it is this idea of a zapper so this is a specific frequency of energy i think from memory it's an offset square wave that will uh disrupt the activity of the parasites and, eat, and and other organisms as well and will even kill them and so there was like a more advanced machine that you could kind of modulate the frequency so there'd be like one frequency for Provitella and one for Salmonella and one for Helminths and all the rest of it. And then there was also this kind of just all purpose zapper that the frequencies were supposed to just kill everything kind of thing. So those like the basically the two types that were available. And then within that, there was like like a whole body zapper and like a handheld one, like a little thing with a nine volt battery inside. You could just put on a specific place, for instance. Um, and so that was the other part that is, you know, from any kind of understanding still up until now anyway, a lot more spurious, right, that something like that would actually work. Although, in my experience, um, it actually can make a huge difference. Um, so you I, actually tried those machines? I have, yeah. The measuring ones I'm not so convinced at, but, um, you know, I had one person who, uh, I had uh, a friend who, put it on their face, their cheek. Um, and then 
they, it kind of created a bit of a burn, which you could just say is because it's bad for you, but from this school of thought, they kind of believe that it's because it's, uh, you know, frying some kind of organism. But <laughs> she claimed that she actually had a worm wriggle out of her face uh, uh, as she was doing it. Um, it completely freaked her out. And there's all kinds of people who make all kinds of claims like this, not usually the face, but, you know, all, all kinds of other areas of the body. And of course they can, they can, they can exist in it. Some of them can exist in any muscle tissue. So of course it's not outside the realm of possibility at all. Um, and uh, for me, you know, I had that time when I was in hospital with this extremely swollen ankle that doctors never found out what the cause of it was. This is a long 15 minute story. I think I've told it before. I won't go into it now, but the zapper was the only thing that made it start to get better. And could say it's placebo effect. Look, I was in the worst pain of my life. I had already tried several dozen other things I thought would be effective, none of which were. Um, I was skeptical about this thing and I only bought it because it was part of this whole protocol that I was doing at the time. So maybe it was placebo effect still. Um, but it worked when nothing else did for this particular, in this particular case. And you can look it up. There's all kinds of people who swear by zappers. Um, there is a possibility again, which is contested, that um, that they're not 100 percent positive, though. That this, in the same way that a that a, a chemistry that will kill bad organisms might also do some harm to your cells, there is a possibility that a, a electric frequency that kills these organisms might also be not optimal for your own cells, and so. Um, is it worth it in many cases if you actually have organisms that would be killed by that organism? In the case of either a drug or a herb or this device, quite possibly, right? But I do think that you want to uh, not just do it all the time, not just do it willy-nilly, not just do it without knowing that you're actually doing something. That, that that there is actually some positive effect happening. And, you know, as much as I've seen, at, you know, as well as my own, I've as I said, come across many anecdotes of people saying it's really helped them. I've also seen many anecdotes of people saying it made them feel worse. And then what you're generally told if you're in that community is, oh, it's detox, it's Herxheimer's, you know, stick with it. But of course, it may just be that it's damaging you. <laughs> and so like how to actually delineate that is not particularly easy. But it's something, you know, that I want to get into. And so, yeah, the, the book, The Cure of All Diseases, which I've read twice. I think I've read parts of most of the other ones. But The Cure of All Diseases is the one I've really, you know, uh, got into and kind of memorized. A lot of the book is just like, you got this health problem. Here's what I would do. They're just like recipes, like protocols for... Uh, all kinds of issues. You know, you have an ear infection, do this. You have uh, depression, do this. You have headaches, do this. You have sinus issues, do this. Just like, you know, the huge collection of if then. Um, and that's what comprises really a lot of the book, along with a lot of, you know, anecdotes and stories of uh, this person had this and I did this and then they got better, that kind of stuff. And so it's a very interesting book. Um, it's one of those things I think is well written. And so if you are I don't know, quite open-minded and or desperate <laughs> for a solution. Uh, it's very easy to read it and go, oh, this is it, and, and really get into it. And and that may not be a bad thing because it may be, it may be exactly what you need. Right. Depending. I mean, yeah, depending. And as we've, you know, talked about and looked at you know, quite a few different things, um, especially as it pertains to the Rejuvenate Blueprint out of the, those seven steps, then, you know, this is definitely one of those steps along the way. But while we're still talking about Dr. Clark, I mean, because so let's say somebody doesn't know her, they go online. Because um, even when I was doing that, you could see like uh, these claims, this and that, like, you know, there's some potential controversy around, you know, definitely. her work and things like that too. Especially because so. the electric devices, right? Like the... Things like wormwood and garlic and all these things. I, I just want to say as well, this idea of killing parasites obviously did not start with Holder Clark. She's often where I can trace back the kind of protocols and thinking of people in the alternative health scene now. But of course, this is something that's been going on for, uh, or documented going on for thousands of years. You know, throughout the world, human beings have had this issue and they have had to find solutions for it. 
you know, uh, whether it's the Amazon, whether it's, you know, uh, in Asia, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in Africa, you know, whether it's, we're talking about traditional tribes or whether we're talking about very advanced civilizations like the Romans, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians, like they all had this awareness of parasites. They all had protocols for dealing with it. Um, and so that's one of the defenses as well of, let's just say in generally beyond the whole of the pro-parasite people is, you know, this is something that was well known to be a significant factor in disease um, throughout history. And actually a lot of the world still does. So this is, you know, people say, like Americans often say in Europe, they routinely treat parasites, but you know, we're in Europe right now, Chrissy in England, you know, people don't in England, uh, but in some countries in Europe, they do. In some countries in Europe, people regularly do. In Russia, they certainly do. Uh, for instance, depending if you class Russia as part, and other countries, uh, you know, Russia adjacent, um, that, you know, have similar Slavic or whatever uh, uh, people, they, you know, it's much more common to do parasite cleansing, even though they would not be classed high risk. And then, of course, by, by modern medicine. And then, of course, places that would be classed high risk, whether it's South America, whether it's Africa, whether it's Southeast Asia, uh, all those kind of places, they all have they're all aware of parasites and have their own, you know, treatment methods and stuff. Uh, so I just want to, before we, you know, I just want to say the controversy is more, I, I, I think it's the electric thing, like being able to diagnose people with this frequency thing. Honestly, I'm pretty skeptical of, um, and being able to treat them with this frequency thing. Most people are skeptical of, although I've had a bit more experience that tells me there might be, you know, that might be more valid than most people think. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. And especially when, and we have seen this with other naturopathic practitioners where they are bringing something to the forefront that isn't medical. It's, um, you know, a little bit, how can I say, not what the norm would be, then, you know, people have gone after them. They've, you know, had to, um, you know, protect themselves in certain ways. So really looking at it in the sense of, again, as we always say, find what resonates with you. If it's the right thing, investigate it, and then make the choice from that place of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, okay, how do you know if it could apply to you? Well, if you do, as I said, fall into this corner of the internet, um, it's basically like, they, they, you know, you can easily get convinced that if you have any health problems, you know, like all the usual suspects, all the stuff we talk about, um, 
their headache and low energy and sinus problems and digestive problems and joint pain and you know rest, uh, lung issues and bladder issues and all of the usual stuff that that you know those are all rooted in in parasites or uh you know partially rooted in parasites and so it, it's very easy to think oh well then it definitely does apply to me so one of the things that i would say is that is a medical test that you can do which does give some indication if this is worth pursuing for you or not and it is your eosinophils interesting okay and why what do the eosinophils tell us is it about a raised infection you know what what are they looking for so eosinophils are a type of white blood cells and yeah if you literally look at the most mainstream you know, whatever, like, why are my eosinophils raised? Um, you will usually be told it is either allergy or parasites, uh, or possibly sometimes they say inflammation. So those are the three things that could raise it. Um, now, if they are raised, but you do not have the textbook obvious, um, like, uh, um, pre presentation, I guess that's the word, of parasites, then a normal mainstream medical professional will say, uh, probably a little bit of allergies or maybe even a lot of allergies if it's very high, and they will kind of dismiss it. In this case, this to me, though, is where I would be a little bit more open and put a little bit more credence to the idea that maybe those kind of hold a clock ish parasite corner may be helpful to you because why are the eosinophils okay so when the eosinophils are raised a person has more allergies they have more ige activity that is a fact that there is definitely uh you know a correlation however saying that allergies are causing eosinophils is it's like it's circular thinking. There's there's no root cause identified at all, right? It's not it's not one of the seven parts of the rejuvenate blueprint, which so far no one has come up with an eighth, right? So so it's not one of those. So it's missing something. And so why are the eosinophils raised? Well, one of the reasons that they could be raised is because of genetics. I have a client right now who has that. Uh, in in fact, I have a, you know I've got two clients who have that in their genetics. Um, they have a tendency for high eosinophils in their genetics. And sure enough, they have had high eosinophils their whole life <laughs> in their blood tests. But I say their whole life, the whole, since they've been doing blood tests, which, you know, in both cases hasn't been that long. But we're kind of guessing their whole life because they've had allergic, you know, um, symptoms as well for most of their life, most of the time. So there is a genetic component to this. Some people's genetics mean that their immune system will create large amounts of eosinophils um, in response to something. That is a fact. So, so the theory is that the eosinophil creation, so this is going back to the more mainstream idea, the theory would be that the high eosinophils are in response to um, an allergen. That's pollen cat hair, wheat, um, uh, peanut, whatever, right? Like it's it's a response, dust, dust mites, like it's response to, what they're saying is, it's a res the, the highest eosinophils are a response to something. I am a little bit skeptical about that though, and I can't prove this, unfortunately, and unfortunately there hasn't been the studies on this um, at all to prove it one way or the other. But I do think it is possible that the the that some kind of hidden parasite is what's raising the eosinophils, and then the allergies are correlated. Like it's the other way around. It's not that the allergen has caused a raising of the eosinophils. It's the parasite has caused a raising of the eosinophils which then raises the IgE, which then causes the allergy. Do you see what I mean? It's like the other way around, because otherwise then you've got to ask, well, what causes the allergy? 
right? Right. There's okay. got to be something <laughs> present that's making this thing go. Yes, and it could be something else. What else can cause an allergy? It could be uh, a nutritional deficiency that's imbalancing the immune system, you know, overcreating the inflammatory type, undercreating the regulatory type. Um, it could be a hormonal imbalance. It could be like a lack of thyroid or a lack or excess of cortisol. Um, it could be, uh, well, I could just go through my whole list, right? <laughs> it could be any of the seven pretty much um, that are doing it. But the parasites is a candidate. And especially if uh, you have a, a history of, you have been to those kind of countries where parasites are more common ever, because you know, they often limited it to a year ago or two years ago, or three years ago, but it could have been 20 years ago. If it was never addressed, it was never addressed. They could still be there, especially if you've been having a healthy lifestyle-ish and you have, you know, been doing maybe the, uh, without realizing it, like, you know, lot, some people will have garlic with every meal, for instance, you know, that can keep knocking down a lot of these organisms without actually fully addressing and resolving the issue, you know, just as one example, right? So you might have been accidentally treating the uh, the parasite, like from, you know, overgrowing too much. And I mean, that's not the case of something like a tapeworm, right? But maybe not that kind of parasite, but other types of parasites, you know, pinworms and hookworms and stuff like that. Like you can kind of just go through a phase where you keep killing them, but then you don't get all the eggs and then they grow back again. And that just keeps happening over and over and over again. So that can go on for decades as far as I am concerned, you know? Um, so, so, you know, if you have that factor going on, um, obviously if you are dealing with animals regularly and their waste, uh, or even just soil, if you're a gardener or whatever, and you're not careful about washing your hands. If you are eating raw fish, it absolutely can happen. If you are eating pork, even cooked pork, but you know, especially if it's ever not 100% cooked pork, it can definitely happen. Um, if you're dealing with young children, their waste, it can definitely happen because the mainstream uh, medicine, as I said, they do acknowledge that Parasites happen reasonably commonly in children. Why do they admit that? Because children are reasonably commonly putting their mouths and hands in all kinds of places they shouldn't be. I mean, that's really why. It's not like children are magically more susceptible. It's just that children are, you know, often putting all kinds of things in their mouth that they shouldn't be and they're not fastidious about washing their hands. Well, you know who else is often putting things in their mouth that shouldn't be and is not fastidious about washing their hands? A lot of adults, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is yes. the reality. Um, so, it, you know, it definitely is more within the realm of possibility than a lot of people think. So I think eosinophils are worth testing. If your eosinophils are zero, which is actually what you want them to be, then I would say unless you have significant immune system dysfunction – um, significant meaning you probably know about it, then I probably wouldn't think that you have parasites, honestly. Now, why do I give that caveat? Because of course it's possible to have something and your body is not identifying and not dealing with it. So yes, it's possible that you have parasites somewhere and your eosinophils are zero. But as I said, unless you know you have some kind of real immune system problem, some autoimmune disease, something... It's probably not that likely. Like when you have some parasite somewhere, even if it's a muscle or your brain or whatever, um, your your immune system kind of does identify it and it does usually raise the eosinophils. So um, if you have eosinophils at zero, I would not worry about it. Even if they're in the middle of the range, then it's a bit more, hmm, don't know, right? Now, you might be saying... There's probably someone watching who's like, well, my eosinophils were zero and I took this parasite thing and I felt way better afterwards. And so then we get, we could, if you're ready, Chris, we could go into the other thing, which is the antiparasitics actually help with loads of other things <laughs> other than just parasites. And so that could be the reason why, and, you know, and I've, you know, what really matters to me, I mean, obviously I love to learn and to understand why things happen and all the rest of it, but I fully acknowledge that what matters is results. And so I've said this before about like some of the things that I used to teach, I got the why about doing it wrong, but it was a good idea. 
And so it still helped people anyway, even if I even though I was wrong about why you should be doing it. And I think there's probably a substantial proportion of people in the, you know, whether they know it or not, hold the Clark camp, you know, people who've been influenced by her or by other people who've been influenced by her, um, who have benefited, uh, who maybe it wasn't parasites, even though they thought it was, but they still got better anyway. And that's because there seem to be some very interesting benefits to a lot of these par anti-parasitic energy uh, um, substances that go beyond just parasites. Well, I mean, just to going into where you were talking about her protocol of, you know, assisting the kidneys first, then looking at the liver, and then going into the anti-parasite cleanse. Already, you know, just sorting out those um, areas of elimination and detoxification, supporting those, that's going to, I would assume, going to have a health benefit for people anyway. But moving into these anti-parasitics. So, Definitely. Oh, sorry, yeah. let me just address yeah, that. go ahead. A lot of people don't do that, and that's partly why I wanted to kind of call that out, you know. So a lot of people will, they don't know they're being influenced by Holder Clark. That's what I see most often. So they'll they'll do kind of pieces of, you know, her kind of protocol. Maybe they'll be taking some kind of, you know, wormwood, black clove, uh, black walnut clove combination, but they've never heard of Holder Clark. And so I just want to say, you know, you're, you're doing kind of step four or something of her process and really... You know, if you're going to do that, it would be better to do the other steps, as you're saying. So I do agree. If people do the full process of hers, there's lots of other explanations as to why they could be getting better. Absolutely. The other person who's tangential to that is called Andy Cutler. I don't know if you've heard Did of you him. Did you say Cutler? C-U-T-L-E-R. Okay. Yeah. No, I haven't heard of Andy Cutler. Okay. And so he was kind of part of that world. I'm not sure of exactly the relationship, but there's definitely like overlapping followers. And so his focus was more on the heavy metal part of the equation. Remember I said that she believed that um, toxins and infections were the two root causes of all disease. So he was kind of in her world, but more focused on the toxin part of it, especially heavy metals. And he had these protocols for mercury especially, but for other heavy metals as well. And again, mixed results. Some people really helped them. Some people... It made them worse, honestly, and that's because when you, you know, he recommended just like her quite powerful things and like DMSA and alpha lipoic acid. And if you have mercury poisoning and you take things like that, it will start to move those metals. And again, you, you can easily overload your system. You can easily make yourself feel worse. But the, I say this to say that one thing I wish I I wish I'd found Andy Cutler's work earlier. Not because I did his heavy metal protocol, that was too intense for me, but because he had this distinction. So he added two steps even before the kidney cleanse and the liver cleanse, which was super helpful for me. And that's, he said, the first thing you need to do is get the adrenal glands regulated. <laughs> and, and the second thing you have to do is get the thyroid function working. And if you do not do that, if your adrenals are... Uh, you know, have a tendency to be overstimulated or if they're collapsed or if they veer between the two, or if your metabolism is too low, then your body is not going to be able to detoxify well. Your immune system is also going to be under-functioning. And so everything else is going to be, uh, you know, a waste of time or it might actually make things worse. And so I just wanted to mention that to say, for the, you know, I wish I'd have known when I was doing the whole Clark protocol that distinction, and I would put that even before. So I would do the order as if you want to do, as I said, one of these people's protocols and not mine, like start with the adrenal, then the thyroid, then the kidney cleanse, then the liver flush, and only then move on to the, the anti parasitic, anti fungal, anti, you know, whatever. And he, and Andy Cutler for a second, he would say to do all of that. Uh, and then go on to the heavy metal uh, cleanse. And so I think a lot of people with Andy Cutler, to be fair to him, they go straight into taking DMSA or something like that, and they skip all those other steps beforehand, and then they end up feeling worse than they did before. And so... Well, and that makes sense. Yeah. And that makes sense because, it, like we said just previously, and we've said uh, in other episodes that we've done, if the pathways are not clear, it's just going to build up and you're going to feel like rubbish. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So 
I mean, that would be getting into a whole nother, I mean, we've done a few episodes on adrenals and thyroid and things. So we'll put some links in the description below for anybody that wants to catch up on any of those if you haven't seen them yet. Um, you were talking about antiparasitics. So they don't just have that, that they're there to get rid of the parasites. You said they also have some other properties, which could also, if the parasite isn't the issue, could be helping people get better. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So uh, basically, in a nutshell, what they do is they uh, disrupt the uh, parasite in a sp specific way. And it seems that this type of disruption works on not just um, parasites. And uh, yeah, what are parasites? Let's just talk about this for a second. So, you know, the CDC definition is you've got three classes, protozoa, uh, hell nymphs and ectoparasites on a more practical level if we're talking about you know okay but what have i got you know there's roundworms uh, pinworms hookworms tapeworms uh, liver flukes um, there is other stuff uh, like trichinella uh, ascaris it's another one that um, dr clark frequently talks about um whipworms so you know th there's a bunch of different ones and they can go anything from like a tapeworm i think the longest one recorded is like 40 or 50 foot long so it can be just this huge thing that's you know throughout your whole intestinal tract um and i guess when we think of parasites that's probably more what we think of we think of like a big worm but a lot of them are actually small they're actually uh, you can barely see them or, you know, like tiny little maggots kind of thing, little wiggly things that you might be able to see in your store uh, or as crawling out of your cheek or whatever. Yeah, or um, as well, anybody that's <laughs> done a colonic where they're like, oh, look there, and they show it to you as it floats by on the screen. <laughs> well, let's address that as well. Um, and then often, just to finish the sentence, and then they can be so small you can't see them, right? So that's the other thing. You need a microscope to see them. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's a great point. So there is another school that talks a lot about parasites, and it is the like, school of thought, I mean. Um, and it is the world of colonic hydrotherapists. And so the type of parasite that they normally point to, and when I did colonic therapy um, training, there was a lot of talk about this, is what they call um, a rope parasite. And it looks pretty big. And so uh, I have not done the test myself personally, Chrissy, so I cannot swear to this, but a lot of people, not even mainstream people, but um, you know, kind of alternative people in this world who have looked into it are convinced that when those things are actually sequenced, it turns out it's all human DNA. So they're not actually uh, parasites. So what is it? It's the um, uh, mucus layer of the intestines. Ah, interesting. So it's like a buildup of stuff that shouldn't be there, like the scum or whatever that lines your drain that goes down. That's just this buildup of stuff. Yeah, it's not properly explained as to, um, like, is it even excessive or is it simply that as the colonic is disrupting it, it kind of starts to ball up. And maybe that's why, because I know what you mean, like it can be f as thick as the whole colonic tube and the whole colonic tube is at least as thick as the small intestine. Um, and so, and it must be coming from the small intestine because when, when people do colonoscopies, it's not in there. So yes, it must be coming from the small intestine. It looks, for anyone who's ever brewed a kombucha, uh, it looks a lot like the SCOBY of a kombucha. And SCOBY stands for symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast so that is what it looks like and that was actually my uh belief because that seemed more reasonable it didn't it doesn't really look like a parasite uh but it does look like a scoby so it's still you know a collection of organisms um and people do feel better a lot of time when it's flushed out as well uh but then again who knows what's going with it right and what i observed with chronic therapy is it's it's especially when people uh, flush out this yellow, dark yellow, or even orange acid stuff. That's when they really feel better. And I don't think it's fully explained what that is either. Um, you know, when I came across Dr. Smith's work, 
I theorise that uh, it may actually be you know, vitamin A, retinoic acid, that because of the colour of it. Um, but again, that's only a theory that hasn't been tested. But apparently, what has been tested is this stuff, this SCOBY-looking stuff, which a lot of practitioners, colonic practitioners, call a parasite, um, and it is actually all human DNA. And so to answer your question, I don't know. What I see again and again, Chrissy, is that a lot of people um, don't have acomancia, which is a type of bacteria. I think when we looked at yours, you didn't have it. I didn't have it. Um, and so acomancia is a type of bacteria that is supposed to do lots of very interesting things, um, like uh, you know stimulate AMPK and it's a GLP-1 agonist. And so basically it's supposed to help with longevity. It's supposed to help with weight loss. It's supposed to help with blood sugar balance, all these kind of things. But it's called acomancia mucinophilia. And so the reason it's called that is mucin um, being this uh, mucus layer in the intestines and then philia meaning love. So it's, it loves mucus. And so it's one of the only bacteria that actually feeds on that mucus layer. Most bacteria do not, uh, but this particular bacteria does. So one possibility is, and I don't, this is just guessing, but maybe an absence or relative absence of that bacteria stops um, that maybe it's like uh, that bacteria is supposed to be there to kind of do a pruning process on the um, on the um, uh, mucus layer to stop it becoming excessive and maybe if it's not there that doesn't happen and maybe that's why when people do colonics and they flush that stuff they feel better maybe they did have an you know an excess buildup of mucus and maybe it's positive to flush it out but that's a lot of maybes i just said in that right. sentence right that's you know that's just guessing again unfortunately we don't know but um yeah i think the actual and i i have seen flukes in a parasite i think it looks kind of like a slug kind of creature so i have seen that in clonics but it's not common i don't think i have seen uh pinworms it's a very small white translucent looking you can barely see them little things but again it's not common so yes i think there are parasites but i think there's also a lot of clonic hydrotherapists who i think usually they're not uh they're not trying to deceive you they believe it but they're trying to they're, they're, they're also they kind of want to believe it because it makes it seem like what they're doing is extra valuable right it's like look we're flushing out these horrible disgusting creatures who are feeding on you that seems like a really good thing so i don't know if it is as common. But then again, there's a big I don't know because, as I just said, lots of parasites can't even be seen by can't the human eye. Can't even be seen, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you make a very, very good point. <laughs> so the reason I'm more skeptical about it being common is because it rarely shows up in stool samples. And so if it doesn't show up in a stool sample, then why is it frequently being flushed out by a colonic like with most people? That seems, that's the reason I'm more suspicious. Um, yeah, you bring up a really good point because, I mean, yeah, when we looked at, at mine, you know, it said there isn't any infections, things like that. But I know I've had colonics in the past where like, oh, yeah, look at that and there's that kind or this and that. So you're like, but why wouldn't that be coming up? And maybe, you know, it's just a, a your question because then, yeah, go ahead. You're going to say something. <laughs> well, so that's a... There's the conspiracy angle, right? That's the other part of it. Um, and so some people, I've seen elaborate conspiracies around this. Um, there are some people who believe that, you know, and you and I have talked about this, I think on this podcast once before, about how those in power are evil. Well, there is a whole kind of school of thought, which is not as crazy as it sounds, that, um, you know, some the reason why uh, some people are so, dis let's just say dysfunctional rather than evil. And I think dysfunctional is a better word because if you think about, if you think about Eve, I, I'm not against making moral judgments, but if you think about evil for a second, what is evil? So evil might be uh, wanting power over others, wanting to control other people, not caring about other people, only caring about yourself, enjoying other people's suffering, being deceitful. Those are the kind of things we associate with evil, right? But and it, it may be predatory behavior if you want to remove the uh, morality for a second. So, and this all makes sense because pretty much every animal species, despite this kind of 
Disney mentality that used to exist a few decades ago. Uh, there is cruelty, there is selfishness, there is you know behavior that you could consider sadistic. Like all of these things, like animals do too, um, at some of the time. But what no other animal seems to do is like destroy its own environment and make its own environment uninhabitable to itself, right? With with one exception. And so there is a specific case where animals do things that blatantly violate their own survival and reproduction and even the survival and reproduction of the whole tribe, whatever you want to call it, depending on the animal, or even species, and that is when they're infested with parasites. So there's a great book about this called Parasite Rex, and basically parasites can get in there and they can control your nervous system, they can control your brain, they can rewire, recode your DNA, uh, they can make you uh, attracted to different type of sexual partner, they can make you want to go to different places, they can make you want to put yourself in a dangerous situation. And so, you know, like a reasonably well-known one of, of this is like this... Uh, a parasite that um, gets eaten by, oh, I can't remember, some kind of insect, and then it makes the insect go out, like, and basically prayed in front of a bird, like, hey, I'm here, and then the bird will come and uh, snap it up and eat it. And so this happens because the parasite is trying to get into the bird. And so it uses the insect as a vehicle to achieve that. Now, again, I read Parasite Rex 15 years ago, so I'm not explaining this very well, but um, again, this is mainstream science that in every other animal, except for, of course, humans in first world countries, God forbid, uh, parasites have a history of going into those animals and adjusting their behavior to suit their own ends, not the end of the animal that they're in. So there is this conspiracy theory is that the reason that human being... Are, reason human beings are acting so insane, not just power-hungry, selfish, sadistic, and all the usual stuff that predators and, you know, dominators are, but actually poisoning their own environment. Like, I never believed in a lot of stuff, chemtrails and poisoning the water and all this, poisoning the air, like, that much in the past, because I was always like, I know you think that all these rich people, these whoever are so evil, and I understand that, but why would they poison their own environment? That didn't make sense to me, right? So... Yeah, because that's sure. always been the question. It's like those massive companies out there, they're, they're just they're, they're the toxic overload that our bodies have, that our environment has. It's like, yeah, but they left to live here too. It's like <laughs> think about they're it. being exposed as well. If you're evil, that would mean that maybe you would enjoy the suffering of poisoning everyone else around you. Maybe you would enjoy profiting off, the, you know, poisoning everyone else around you. All of that makes sense. That's normal in the context of evil and every other animal species has cases where that happens, as I said, even the really innocent ones like dolphins or whatever. But no other animal, again, unless they're being controlled by a parasite, does things that are actively even self destructive or destroying their own family you know their own family line their own genetics or whatever so again the conspiracy theory is that the reason why um the lab tests often don't pick it up is because of some kind of you know scientific intervention and this is not outside the realm of possibility to me um people are like oh how could there be such widespread collusion well look at the events between 2020 and 2022 like the whole world was in on this collusion of locking us down, even though there was, you know, it's proven that there was no benefits. Wearing masks, even though it was proven there was no benefits, at least with the cloth masks, right? Why is it that, you know, it's dangerous to not wear a mask in a room with other people, except for when you're eating and then suddenly it's fine? You know, it's like, it's all just nonsense. Uh, the six foot social distancing. They, they admitted later that was all just made up. It wasn't based on any science. Like, so many of these things. Um, and so, yet, almost every country went along with it. So, almost every government, every 
you know, scientific community, every medical community, there were a few, obviously, protesters, and they were brutally suppressed and silenced. But um, so it's not that it shouldn't be if you've been paying any attention over the last few years, be too crazy to you to imagine that a whole worldwide scientific or medical community might be going along with something, you know, other than a few dissenting voices, right? That's, that's proven that, that can happen. So I'm, I'm kind of just steelmailing this argument, right? I'm not sure I believe it. But so could it be possible that, you know, there is this, um, we don't test for these parasites because uh, the people who are running things are actually being controlled by these parasites. That's the, that's the theory. And, and again, the, the people who are running things, often they are not super healthy. They're quite sickly themselves in various ways. They're engaged in a lot of self-destructive behavior uh, themselves in, you know, in various ways. Again, evil is like, I'm eating the lovely organic food. You guys all eat the poison-filled Cheerios or whatever, right? That's evil. But the, I'm also going to eat the poison-filled Cheerios. Like, Whoa, what, why are you doing why? that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, yeah. that's not only evil. That's something else, right? And so, you know, some kind of parasite is potentially a, um, a, an explanation for that. And, and, you know, and as I said, they can affect... Uh, they, it's proven in animals that they can affect uh, your decision making, your sexual attraction preference, your risk aversion, your uh, so you know animals don't have four processes in the same way as humans. But if they can affect all that, could it affect your thoughts? Could it make you do things that are not in your own interests? Um, it, well, it can make animals do things that are not in their own interests. Absolutely, definitely, documentedly. So, so that's the theory of it. I mean, probably the one that most people have heard is that's a kind of milder example. Of this is with um, uh, candida or yeast infection, right? When you have that, you crave sugar. Yeah. And you're very upset about the idea of not having sugar. Um, I can almost tell if someone <laughs> has a candida infection just by suggesting to them that they might want to go on a, you know, ketogenic diet or whatever. And <laughs> <gasps> not my ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's the upset. Now, you know, obviously if I have like a Ray P client, they're going to be dead against it, but they're not going to be like so upset at the very idea of it. They're just going to have, you know, rational reasons why they don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. Like, the suffering they'll endure of not being able to have it. Right. Indeed. Um, and again, you know, I know I'm going to get some skeptics in there. Some people are going to say, I would just be upset because I know carbohydrates are good for me. Okay, <laughs> fine. But <laughs> um, let's just, you know, most people don't have that firm belief that you do, Peter. And so, <laughs> Ray Peter follower. And so for most people, it is just, um, uh, I think it is often, you know, it's some kind of organism in them that has that kind of reaction. And, you know, def so, you know, it can give you cravings for certain kind of food, right? We know, we know organisms give you cravings for certain kind of food. So is it that crazy to think they could, you know, make, you know, influence all kinds of decisions? It's, it's possible, right? And so that's the conspiracy theory. To answer your original question, took a while to explain that one. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I still don't quite understand where where the you know just even in the testing or they just kind of leave it out or you know because I think you'd want to find it out. But as you're saying, well, maybe they don't. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. But well, um, well, just, all right. Just to explain the theory. So, um, you know, why is it, for instance, that you know with thyroid dysfunction now, TSH is the only thing that most people look at, right? It doesn't really make sense. It's because someone asserted it. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about that before. So everybody's just gone along with it now. Everyone that's goes along just, with it. That's it. Why? <laughs> why was why was saturated fat replaced with seed oils in the nineteen eighties? It was actually just one man's mission. I wish I remembered his name. But it was one guy who decided it based on faulty science that seed oils were healthy and that saturated fats, animal fats, were not. And he managed to change the whole system. And now you're not allowed to question it. So is it that it, it doesn't even need a conspiracy of a thousand parasite infested person. It could literally be one person who pushes the science totally in this direction. And if they are persuasive enough and they have enough things going on their side, everything else could fall into place. It's, it's again, 
based on the amount of these mistakes that we've seen, I, you know, just the last couple of days I've been studying something called the glymphatic uh, system, Chrissy, which is... Um, yeah, I've heard about it. It's the, um, the lymphatic system, of the, but of the brain and the spinal cord, correct? Yeah, and this is something that osteopaths, chiropractors, craniosacrotherapists have kind of just assumed was there and kind of acted as if it was there. But it's something that mainstream science and medicine was absolutely determined was not the case until literally just a few years ago. And now they are sure and they've even, you know, they've got MRI that has caught it happening and stuff like that. And now they're convinced. But until relatively recently, it was a conspiracy theory that the brain had any of you know had its own lymphatic system right it was a spurious evidence-free conspiracy theory until it wasn't and so we've got to remember um that like science is a method of uh, and a good method of deducing truth it is not an authority the idea that um this is the way it is because i said so well who are you i am the science I am a scientist and therefore I know what's true and shut up. That That is not science. That is, a, that is authoritarianism. And honestly, although I'm not against religion, it's a religious thinking. It's because the, the whole point of religion as opposed to science is faith. You have to take things on faith. You know, science is based on evidence, but the whole idea is like nothing, nothing in science should ever be 100%. Or an absolute, you know, it's like, yeah. no, yeah. Yeah. 100% conclusive. It's always, this is, as far as we know, this is the case until and unless new evidence arises that indicates something different. So, uh, but human beings have the tendency for dogmatic thinking as to why that could be a different episode. I don't think that's only parasites. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but just don't confuse that dogmatic. Most people are very insecure and most people are very uncertain and rightly so, because as we just said, most stuff you don't really know. <laughs> so, the, you know, I remember I read this book 20 years ago, something called The Wisdom of Insecurity. It was a good thing, right? But insecurity does not feel good. Generally, the more that we don't know what's true and what's real, the more that we feel anxiety um, and worry and all the rest of it, the more anxiety we feel, the more that we're not able to function. And so there is a small minority of people who are very high in certainty, Sometimes it is because they have a high degree of competence. And so um, they have just a very high success rate. So their predictions are highly accurate. And so because of that, they become very certain in themselves. The problem is, first of all, that those people can still be wrong. And often they find it more difficult to realize that. But second of all, most of the rest of us, normal people who do not have that sense of certainty, because we do not have such a high accuracy rate, when we meet someone who has a high degree of certainty, or seems to, we assume it's because they're right more often than us, and so therefore we should just listen to them. But actually, most people with that very high sense of certainty is not at all based on a high rate of accurate predictions. It is based on delusion and narcissism, and arrogance, and pride. And it's not based on reality, in other words. It's based on completely ignoring all the times that they get it wrong, or blaming that on other people, and only focusing on the times that they got it right. Um, and so, but because most of us are so filled with uncertainty, certain people are very compelling, and it's they're very attractive to the vast majority of people. Now, depending, they're also very up, annoying and upsetting right it can be but yeah it can go both ways but the, <laughs> but to the first part especially if somebody is so insecure and they find somebody that has that yeah this is it and so focused there that they can go oh i can feel safe here because that insecurity does not feel safe and then they're like oh this person's really certain okay great 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 100 <laughs> percent. yeah and that's so that's how gurus and cult leaders and demagogues and all the rest become successful and powerful but you know what as much as that is focused on, but what's not focused on is that institutions create the same effect, but even more, right? So as much as it is, as you everything you just said, 100% true, like it relieves anxiety, makes you feel good and warm and safe to have this certainty come from a person. If you make contact with or even join an institution 
where the very institution, it's, institution itself has this high degree of certainty, then you get all of those feelings of safety and comfort and you get this feeling of belonging and connection and all the rest of it. And so it's so tempting to uh, go along with it. You know, I, I, I had someone who's, you know, a huge fan of mine who um, uh, was very surprised about my lack of formal education and they were encouraging me to, you know, get a doctorate or something. And I said, look, I'm open to it. Uh, if it helps the mission, fine. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to look into it. But what I said is, I think the one thing you're missing is, as much as you like what I do, um, it's not despite having a lack of formal education. It's actually more because of a lack of formal education. It's because I have not been indoctrinated into those systems of um, conformity of thought for whatever reason, because of my disagreeable nature. I'm not saying this makes me any better or whatever, but... Um, and so because of that, I'm actually able to think freely and just focus on what is true and what is real. Whereas most people I see, they're just defending the mainstream. And so, you know, some people, I know in my comment section, for instance, half of the people are really thankful at me promoting the work of, you know, Grant Jenneru and Dr. Smith about the, the idea that vitamin A may be a toxin or, you know, certainly the having toxic amounts is more common than most people think. But, you know, a significant percentage as well are like, oh, but vitamin A is useful for this and that. And it's, you know, and I always say, like, you're just giving me the mainstream perspective. Like, it, it may be true and it may be right, but I, I do not understand, because I don't have it in me, this desire to defend the mainstream, the institutional, let's say, perspective on things. Because the institutional perspective, it already has so much defense. It's already won. There's, only, there's just us at the fringes here who are questioning things. And sometimes we're wrong, but sometimes we're right. And we can make a massive difference. Because, you know, when most people are wrong about anything, like with the glymphatic nervous system, the thing that we, uh, lymphatic system, nervous system connection that we just talked about earlier, the people who ignore the mainstream and just carried on acting as if there was a glymphatic system, we're helping a lot of people, <laughs> right? And they so we're getting somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I'm not interested in hearing all the scientific evidence about why there is no lymphatic system in the brain. I'm interested in hearing about the evidence as to why there might be. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. But that's what I'm interested in hearing about. Like, I'm not interested in the institutional perspective in most cases. Now, I know it, you know, because that's the other side of it is that there's people who are the perennial conspiracy theorists, right? Like they, they are, the more outlandish it is, the more likely they are to believe it. Um, and I'm not a fan of that either. So, you know, I, I <laughs> because it's also has, as much as the institu institutions often get it wrong, the conspiracy theorists do get it wrong way more. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm only interested in accuracy. I'm not trying to go against the institutional for the sake of it i want to know what the institutional think and i want to know why they think it and i want to know the idea behind it but i'm not interested in defending it because there's already whole institutions who are dedicated to, to defending their specific perspective right i'm interested in learning about the non-institutional perspectives in case not because i think they're right just because they are different but just in case they are right it's can be super super important it can be you know life-changing and this whole thing about the power of uh, anti-parasitics is another example to come back full circle to what we're supposed to be talking about um you know for for decades now there there's been this school of people who've been saying these anti-parasitics are amazing you know one of holder clark's other books as well was literally i can't remember the title but it was literally something like how to cure C word, <laughs> which again is a hell of a claim. And I'm pretty sure she got into legal issues because of it, because you're not allowed to say that. Um, but now, as I said, just sent you the link, there is peer reviewed research studies. Uh, and there was, as I said, even before that abundance of evidence building up of people who are making themselves better of these life threatening so called terminal diseases with basically just anti-parasitics. And again, I'm not interested in defending the institutional idea about why that sh isn't possible. <laughs> What's the point of that? I want to investigate, is it true? Is it possible? And if so, why? 
right? And so that's I'm very glad that in this case, this uh, this uh, team of scientists, which again we'll give you the link to, did ask that question and they did do that research, and they did it in a mainstream enough way that other institutions are now starting to accept it and and peer review it. That's what peer reviewing is. Um, and I think probably in ten years or something it will become more mainstream, probably unless it's suppressed because you know there are too many powerful interests keeping. And again, maybe it doesn't work in a lot of cases. Maybe there's good reasons not to do it. I'm open to that, and I think, but I think all that should be investigated and it should be explored. Um, but I don't think it should be suppressed. And so I'm glad that, in a way, to bring it full circle to Holder Clark that her position is being vindicated, that even if maybe she's wrong about, you know, a lot of people having parasites, maybe it is as uncommon as mainstream medicine says it is, but even if it is as uncommon as mainstream medicine says it is, her protocols still were helpful. <laughs> she yeah. wasn't imagining it. No, exactly. And so what would it be about those, um, about the, that protocol that despite it, you know, parasite or not, that would be effective? What is it doing? Um... So I don't think it's fully understood. That paper that I sent you a link to will explain it better than I could. But my understanding is it's uh, my simple, very simple understanding. It's disrupting the cell, the electrical and uh, the electrical potential of the water in the cell in a way that is much more of a problem for. Uh, parasites and cells afflicted with viruses, with neoplasmas. And I think, although this is not fully clarified yet, possibly cells of senescence as well. So basically it is uh, causing much more of a problem for cells that have this particular type of unstructured water in them um, that have this particular electrical potential. I know that's not explained great. It's because it's new science, and I haven't fully yeah you know, no. And I've got the it. I've got the study right up in front of me, and a kind of as abstracted as it is, and I don't understand it. But something's sort of in there because it's talking about um, the metabolism of the cancer cells, and then by disrupting whatever that they're sitting in, like you're saying, that that's that's the crux of how it's having an effect, something along that line. And if anybody wants to read this paper and help us out and give us a breakdown in layman's terms, that anybody can understand it, please do so. Leave it in the comments. <laughs> yeah, so this was the take of uh, someone called Anabology, at Anabology on Twitter. This was his, I'm not saying it's correct either, just like I'm not saying the study is right, but this was his understanding of what was in the study that makes it a little bit more understandable. Um, so he's saying they disrupt microtubules um, in the same way that some other FDA-approved cancer drugs do, uh, that by disrupting the skeleton of the cells, uh, the they stop cell division. Um, so microtubules also structure large amounts of water inside cells, and disrupting microtubules could change the structure of water in the cell. Um, so the uh, mutated cells noticeably lose their structured water state, which contributes to their unchecked growth. So right, 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 um, right. those cells are electrically depolarized, so the water structure um, was expected to be different as well, which it turned out that it was. Um, so briefly, uh, drugs like fenmendazole may fix the water structure within those cells um, with uh, so that's for fenbendazole in the case of ivermectin. The standard structure is that it paralyzes the parasites by hyperpolarizing their cells, uh, so making them more electrically charged. Um, but that's not the case for humans. Humans aren't paralyzed by ivermectin, even in very large doses. So that's because parasites, uh, parasites tend to have uh, less complexity and less structured water within their cells. Um so in higher organisms like human structured water exists more in differentiated and specialized cell types. Uh, so with ivermectin, it is selectively hyperpolarizing cells with less water structure. Um, 
since bioelectricity and water structure go hand in hand, fixing the cell's voltage often fixes the water structure. This guy, despite the name anabology, I'm pretty sure he is also a research scientist, so this is still not written in a super clear way. Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, they may work by um, preventing the division of cells, which are mutated, and by fixing the water structure uh, within the cells. So in the case of the parasites, um, changing the water structure kills the parasites, but in the case of the uh, mutated human cells, it's actually fixing their um, electrical potential state. So that's the theory at the moment. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Thank you for going into that. I know that was a little unexpected, but yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so great overview. This kind of gone down many twists and turns that has been really, really quite um, fascinating for me. I mean, I think because I did have a list of questions, but throughout our discussion, we've kind of really asked, answered a lot of them. You discussed, you know, how common it is, how do we get them, how do we know if we have them, Um the one thing is, you know, like uh, what diseases and symptoms an individual would potentially have, because you also discussed how to get rid of them by potentially following Dr. Holda Clark's protocol, or there are some other protocols out there. Um, so yeah, what would be some symptoms um, or diseases that potentially could be caused by this? Or is it a wide gamut of it? Like how... How could we identify? I mean, I know we've got the idea, and which is great, of looking at the eosinophils, or potentially if it's a visible thing that we can see. Um, so yeah, what do you think? Well, so it could be anything, as you just said, like depending on where it is, right? Like in the brain, it could cause seizures and all kinds of things, like things that you would never associate with parasites. But if we're talking about like the typical obvious stuff, then we're going to think, okay, what is the most likely thing that a parasite will do? So it's most likely to be in your digestive system. Now, of course, it can break through the barrier of your digestive system, get into the circulatory system, in which case it could get anywhere, but that's less likely than it just stays in the digestive system. So first thing would be digestive issues. Now, of course, there are loads of other things that could create digestive issues, as you know, diarrhea, constipation, gas, nausea, all of that kind of stuff. But you know, so many things can cause that. So, um, the like having an itchy anus. Uh, honestly, that's one of the things that's often associated uh, with parasites. Could be caused by other things. Could be caused by inflammation. But that's kind of like, and you see that you know uh, when animals are kind of dragging their. Uh, yes. So that is. Uh, one symptom of yeah. parasites. What kind of parasite do you know or just no? You just know it's a symptom. I, th I think that's pinworm and roundworm off the top of my head. I think not not a tapeworm. Yeah, it's more the little worms. Um, so, you know, s skin issues, uh, potentially, but again, that could be a million other causes for that. One of the other things that is, one of the only other things that's really um, parasite specific that you would be looking for is where there's an unexplained nutritional deficiency. So because the parasite is eating the nutrients, right? A lot of other things. So parasite in there, whether we're talking about huge tapeworm or we're talking about tiny little worms you can't even see, what they all have in common is they are eating your food to some degree. And so, and then they're also excreting waste. Now the excreting waste creates lots of problems, but they are hard to 
there's, there's so many other reasons why you could have toxic waste in your intestine and your body, right? So that's really hard to know it's coming from parasites. But there's not like a million reasons why you could have a situation where you're taking a load of a nutrient and you're still deficient. Like there's only a few reasons for that. Uh, it could be uh, you have a genetic need for more, of course. That's one reason. Um, it could be that you have some other really bad digestive problems that stop your body absorbing it, like a, like a stomach acid, like uh, like a bile or whatever. But especially if it's not specific. So, for instance, you know, if you're just low in one nutrient, um, then that's more likely to be a genetic thing. That's more likely to be a digestive, a, a malabsorption thing. But if you are generally depleted in all nutrients, you know, like if you're losing more and more weight, you know, cases where people are, people think you're anorexic or something, but you're not, you're eating normally, you know, like really obvious stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, it might be anemia, it might be weakness and fainting, it might be fatigue, unexplained weight loss, except for maybe around the belly, although not necessarily again, because as I said, some of these parasites can be small. Um, that's the kind of the obvious things I would say that would really uh, uh, point to parasites. Okay. I mean, well, it's still a bit of a wide range of scope, but um, people well, can... I'm not really. I mean, so the extreme is literally, I'm eating, I'm eating, I'm eating, I'm losing more and more weight, I'm becoming anemic. Yeah. Like, that's quite so it's a potential. unusual. Yeah, yeah, it's an yeah. idea. It's it's something, because there could other be also be other ends of it, um, as we've discussed, uh, other things that could be potentially causing it. So that's one symptom that it could potentially be. Yes. Be, oh, sorry, yes. There's loads of other symptoms that are yeah, more yeah, yeah. general, but I would say um, probably the... I'm eating abundance of highly nutritious food or taking loads of supplements and still I'm wasting away. Right. Yeah, then, yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> Warning <laughs> bell. <laughs> Unless you're having, you know, maybe you're taking methamphetamine, maybe you're a bulimic, you know, I mean, obviously. But if you know that none of the other obvious stuff is the case, mm -hmm. then okay. that could be a really obvious one for parasites. Okay. Right. Wow. Okay. So let's say somebody suspects. What should they do? Uh, good question. So I would recommend doing the testing because despite what I just said, sometimes parasites do show up in people's stool and it's super, super helpful to know what type. Um, it, you know, again, you in the same way that you don't want to take broad spectrum antibiotics, if you can help it, um, you want to just take, you know, one specific antibiotic. Uh, you definitely don't want to be taking, you know, loads of different antiparasitics uh, at once if you can if you can avoid it if you if you could just find out it's one type and there's one thing to take to kill it right and when you say uh do the test what test specifically a stool test just a stool test from parasites. from a p company or from your doctor or something a like that you can ask a doctor if they're willing to do it uh you have to you probably have to tell them that you know you've recently been to a tropical country or something <laughs> if that's true great right um then that's you know that makes sense then i mean i had it done when i had my unexplained digestive issues because uh, and of course they didn't find anything. The ones that the doctors do are pretty uh, uncomprehensive in most cases because they're trying to save money. Certainly in well, maybe it's different in America where they bilk you for as much as they can <laughs> sometimes. But in in countries with socialized healthcare like England, they will you know never they'll never spend more money than they feel is absolutely necessary. So true. Um, so. You know, you could order your own, as you said, Chrissy. Um, you can order just a parasite test. I would say if you have digestive issues, probably ordering a broad spectrum digestive test, like a GI map or a GI FX, something like that is good. That will give luck. That will you know examine all kinds of potential causes of whatever your digestive issues and other issues are, because obviously the digestion is often the root of all kinds of other issues. Uh, so that would definitely be a way of finding out. Um, but of course, as we talked about, a all clear and parasites there does not guarantee that you don't well, have them. No, exactly, because you the, just you just saw my test that I showed you, and it said no infection. But you know, it's not to say that that's an absolute, correct? Yeah, I mean that one. Like you did have dysbiosis, but you didn't have infection. Um, so that's you know there there were a bunch of organisms you ideally wouldn't want to have high that were high. Okay. But there were none that would be classed as 
like dangerous. That's that's the distinction between dysbiosis and infection within that specific test, uh, or potentially dangerous. Yeah. Um, well, just to touch on that, then uh, sorry to detract from your line. So then, would it be advisable, like seeing what you just saw on mine, to say, oh, you should go on a parasite cleanse? Well, I was going to say. So the other thing that I would test would be the eosinophils then. Mm. And honestly, as I said earlier, if the eosinophils were zero or close to zero, um, I would not because it means that there is no evidence for it in your digestive system and there is no evidence that your immune system is reacting to them. Um, unless you think that you might have a viral infection, in which case it might still be worth doing because those antiparasitic herbs and drugs often have, uh, have a helpful for viruses unless you feel like you had malignant neoplasmas, that would be a different use case as to why you might want to do it. Um, uh, but for you, with your symptoms and all the rest of it, yeah. uh, Chrissy, yeah. I probably would not because you are healthy overall and doing well overall. And um, they do have some... They're all toxic to some degree or another. Now, the one exception you could say to that is though, but given that you're healthy, given that you don't have such a bad reaction to toxins, many people watching podcasts like this, like, you know, they have reaction to even to simple foods, simple supplements, whatever. But given that you're not that kind of person, there is an argument to be made to do like occasional doses of antiparasitics, not because you think that you have them, not that you need to do like Holder Clark's intensive free week one or anything like that, um, but you could just do her kind of maintenance protocol or you could do like a drug-based one. So you could do like ivermectin or fenbendazole or albendazole or something like that just once and do that once every, you know, two weeks if you want to be like Holder Clark to every six months or a year if you want to be more like... Um, you know, like maybe traditional countries we've talked about where they just do it uh, periodically, prophylactically, because there's a higher risk of infection. And so if I were to recommend you to consider doing it, it would be less because it looks like you definitely have them and more because of a, as long as I take a moderate dose and do it occasionally, I'm strong and healthy and I have no, you know, it's not a big deal to me, the level of toxicity. And it will, in case there are any, it will knock them, out and prevent them from becoming a problem in future so i would say not the intensive version but maybe the maintenance version right okay so i went yeah coming back to the original question if you suspect that you have a parasite the first thing is to do is to test to get that test have a look at the results and then from there you can determine from that result, whether the result comes back and says positive, yes, or no, it's a negative. And then from there, a decision can be made. Yeah, and I would refer back to the Rejuvenate Blueprint. You know, I would say, for instance, if you're low in zinc and selenium and magnesium, then that will stop your immune system from working correctly. That's another reason that you could have high eosinophils. That's another reason why you could have digestive problems. That's another reason why you could have chronic infections. So that should be dealt with first because it's an easy thing to deal with. Um, you would want to look at uh, hormones. You know, we talked about adrenals and thyroid specifically. I definitely think that those would be worth looking at. There's episodes on that. Uh, maybe look at blood sugar balance. Uh, maybe look at sex hormones to, you know, see if that is having a significant impact on your overall health and well-being, if that's, for instance, dysregulating your nervous system, because the nervous system kind of controls everything, including your immune system and your digestive system. So I would look at that. Um, I would look at, you know, lifestyle stuff. Uh, are you getting enough sleep? All of that kind of stuff. I would look at, um, you know, potential emotional causes. Are you constantly upset? Are you traumatized and you don't realize it? All of that kind of stuff. Uh, do you have very negative, uh, you know, victim-like or whatever thought patterns constantly running through your head? Well, that's going to stop you healing. That's going to make you more susceptible to infections. So it's it's all the usual rejuvenate blueprint, right? It's the seven root causes of all disease. And the reason why I just listed those is because my tendency still is in, in most cases, unless it is acute, unless it is an emergency, unless it is really bad, 
I would recommend starting on all the uh, causes other than toxins and infections because those are the most difficult to deal with because you can often feel worse before you feel better, even if it does make you better eventually, and because you can often feel worse and not feel better. <laughs> um, so, you know, for instance, if you don't have an infection and then you take antibiotics or antiparasitics or whatever, it will just make you worse because you haven't dealt with an infection because it wasn't there and you've poisoned yourself to some degree, even if it is mild. So that's made you worse, not better, right? Um, and, you know, ditto with toxins. If, you, if you're if you not prepared to deal with them for whatever reason, we just listed a bunch of reasons, um, then mobilizing them, moving them from storage can make you feel worse and not even just temporarily. They can overload us. They can overload your nervous system, which then puts you into sympathetic, sympathetic state, which then makes healing more difficult forever, potentially, unless you resolve it, you know? So this is a big deal. You don't want to, you know, if you have a bunch of mercury or lead or something stuck in some kind of fat cells or something, and then you, you detox and do a juice fast or whatever, and then your body starts breaking down those fat cells, and then it floods your, your bloodstream and your liver with toxins. Uh, not only is that going on, you have to deal with that, but my understanding and experience these days is then your whole sympathetic nervous system could go into this acute, oh my God, I've been poisoned, I might die panic state. And some people, when they get into that state, they can't get out of it again. And I think that's what happened to me. It took me years to get back out of it. And, you know, maybe arguably I was in it my whole life because of my early childhood experiences or whatever. But I, though maybe people who are in my position are not, the majority, they're certainly not rare either, right? There's a significant minority of people who can easily become overly, who can easily have their sympathetic nervous system overstimulated. And once it's overstimulated, they, it's very difficult for them to calm it back down again and for them to feel safe and at peace and happy and present and all the rest of it. So I do think you want to be careful with detoxification and with chronic infections um, if you are sensitive. Uh, the stronger and healthier you already are, this is why I'd say for someone like you, Chrissy, um, who is pretty strong and healthy, at least these days, right? Then, <laughs> yeah, you know, doing these kind of things, probably a no big deal. It's probably no big deal for you to do a juice fast for a couple of days. It's probably no big deal for you to take like an anti-parasitic, you know, regimen, as I said, you know, like for a day or two or something like that. That, And that may well, you know, worst case scenario, it's a little bit of toxicity for your body to deal with, but that's not a big deal and it's a waste of time. Best case scenario actually finds and addresses some hidden thing that you didn't know was there and you feel loads better. You know, so it really does depend on the person and the situation. Okay. All right. Well, great. Because uh, then that also gives individuals, you know, a starting point. So no, number one, I mean, oh, there's so much information in that is looking at it. And then also too, if you're absolutely uncertain, test, because that's going to help look within and give you some some information. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, brilliant. We've, I mean, pretty much covered everything I think we wanted to cover. Is there anything else that you want to add here as far as, you know, final thoughts, closing, or um, referencing the Rejuvenate Blueprint to our lovely listeners today? Uh, thank you for watching. Please share your experiences uh, in the comments section. YouTube seems to be the thing for now, unfortunately. <laughs> it's the only one, so go and share it there. Uh, tell us about your experiences. Have you tried a parasite cleanse ever? Did it make you better? Did it make you worse? Um, is it something that you you know would want to do? Um, and also tell us what other topics you might like an episode on. This topic was in response to, can't remember the name, but someone suggested it as a topic for an episode and we did it. So we listened to you. Uh, if there's something you want me to do an episode on, sometimes I get suggestions and I can't do it because I don't know enough about it. That's fine too. But in this case, <laughs> I realized, yep, I, it's been a few years, but I can easily do an episode on this. So I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah, so do let us know, um, you know, thumbs up, a heart emoji if you liked it. And again, as always, we love, love spending time with you guys. So thank you for joining us and sharing your precious time. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above and make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.